coming up after the break. Care for a lower alcohol content in your beer and wine? There's a new recommendation that drinks should be weaker. We'll tell you who's making it after the break. Seen any good movies at the theater lately? Probably not. A summer of duds has led to a lot of empty seats and some disappointing financial results for Cineplex. That story kicks off the roundup. Nicole Verkint is the CEO of OMX. So have you seen any good movies at the theater this year, Nicole? Not in the theater, actually, but I think I, I only really go out to the, the movies if there's a, a movie that I really, really want to see. So I think it's really evolving into to be more about the experience, and we're seeing that the content itself and the ticket prices itself, you know, they're kind of stuck with the ticket price. So companies like Cineplex are more like distribution companies, and so they're making their margin on um, the experience. So having the wine and the VIP and the good meals, and I think they're doing a very good job on that side of things. So I think when we talk about their poor results, we're really talking about the content that they're getting being poor. So they're really a slave to the content. Uh, but they're doing very well in their other businesses and in, in, uh, being on you know big business screens and uh, the World Exchange Plaza and different places like that. And um, they recently bought World Gaming and they're really evolving a gaming company to do video games in the theater. So I think what they're, they're getting into that's very smart is they have these theaters that are fixed assets and they can use those fixed assets. And right now they're doing gaming, but I could see a future of uh, corporate training or... Um, all sorts of different things for education purposes. You know, the Pokemon craze, you don't, you never know. So I, 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 do, I do really believe in the company and think it will do well. Well, they do clearly have, need to do something at this point. I mean, at least uh, in this quarter, uh, compared to the same quarter last year, last year they made $25 million in that time frame. This year, $7 million. So that's a 72% drop. But most people are pointing to just the quality of the movies. I mean, with the, the list that I saw, I didn't, hadn't even heard about these movies. And I'm a movie lover. Like, I, yeah. I do like to go to the theater. I go probably maybe, well, not all the time, but maybe five or six times a year. Uh, the Boss, never heard of it. Alice Through the Looking Glass, Central Intelligence, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I heard of that one. Apparently it was a bomb. Suicide Squad, they spent a fortune on that. The Hollywood Studios did. Ghostbusters, the reboot, all just did not perform. So as you say, they're tied to that, right? It just feels like there's a lot of content today. Is it just me or there's just Netflix and there's Amazon Prime and there's everything online? I just... I mean, I, I fly a lot, so I see a lot of movies on airplanes. It just feels like there's content coming from every angle. So. But I think it does depend a lot on what's going on. Like when, they, like last summer, there were these huge hits of Jurassic Park and the Avengers, you know. And if you think about it, like this was an industry that they said, "Oh, this is going to go away." I mean, I remember this is going back probably you know more than a decade. Just when you know DVDs came out, then right. it was streaming. It was like, "Oh, nobody's going to go to the theater anymore." Well, of course, people do still want to have that experience. So, they're, they're, and you're suggesting there could be even more in terms of the experience there, gaming. Yeah, I, I, I do Where see a future for it. In the movie theater. I mean, there's a real asset there, and, and we see D-Box up here on the screen, and that's the, mo that you know, you have the moving you know, simulation almost, and we have 3D, and we get more and more and more experiences in this way, and we see them in theme parks, so... Um, I think people are still craving you know, going out and doing the old-fashioned dinner in a movie, and I think Cineplex is doing really well at having good dinners in the movies and having the <laughs> VIP experience. So there is somewhere for this company to go that I see. I really don't think it is dead because, like you, I, I thought it was a long time ago, but I, I see no, it. it's got a lot of uh, staying power, shall we say. All right, so let's talk about uh, rather a surprise announcement today from Arianna Huffington, founder of the Huffington Post. She is leaving. So this is the online newspaper she started 11 years ago, named it after herself, uh, and then sold it five years ago to AOL, but stayed on as the editor-in-chief. And, you know, out of the blue, now she announced she has a new venture. She actually tweeted the, the news. She put out a tweet saying, I thought HuffPost would be my last act, but I've decided to step down as HuffPost editor-in-chief to run my new venture, Thrive Global. So she put this out to her 2.3 million followers to let them know she was stepping down. What do you make of it? It was a bit sudden, but I actually wasn't surprised because I've, I've always admired her. And I read her book over two years ago called Thrive. I don't know if you've read it or not. It's, it's very inspiring. It's all about balance and wellness. And 
and there was almost nothing in there about Huffington Post. So a few you know, flags went up in my head. I thought, this woman's an entrepreneur. She's a founder of a company. And if you're not spending your entire book talking about the company that you're leading, it's clear her passion had started to go towards this, this new thing, which is what the name of her new company, Thrive. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought she wrote so eloquently. It ended up being a book that I gifted to lots of different entrepreneur friends to talk about. Oh. Yeah, this, this thing you know, called getting enough sleep. And, and so <laughs> yes. I think she kind of got onto this, and she got really passionate about it. And I think a lot of founders have struggled. We've seen a lot of founders struggle in the past with, you know, acquisitions and being owned by large corporations and being, you know, sort of stuck in the, the bureaucracy. And I, I think she probably just likes to start new things and you, she, you can see the spark ignite. And I know one thing, it's really hard to do a, a startup or run a company part-time. I mean, I think you need to be 100% yeah, focused on something. That was another uh, tweet that she put out there was she said, building something from scratch doesn't get easier just because you've done it before. There's only one way to do it with your full attention. But the other thing I'm thinking is she probably like, why do I want two jobs? I need to thrive and sleep and <laughs> avoid burnout. All right, so exactly. let's talk about uh, Macy's, the iconic American department store. It's closing 100 locations, 100 stores. It's shutting yes. down. And, you know, not a huge surprise why a lot of analysts pointing to just that the U.S. doesn't need as many stores anymore because of online shopping. Yeah, I mean, we're still seeing about two-thirds, and I think we're seeing a lot even higher numbers than that with, with clothing and the traditional retail happening in the stores. Two-thirds, what do you mean? Of, of all shopping is still happening in stores. Right, okay. Um, and I think it depends on what you're going out to buy. I don't know about you, but for me, sometimes shopping, you're, you know, you're going out. For me, I go with my mother, and it's more about the experience. And so for things where it's the experience and you're browsing and it's really a, a day thing that you're doing, I think that stuff's still going to stay. There's still going to be that retail. But anything that's spontaneous, that's more of a commodity, uh, for me, that's things like books. Uh, or anything that's really rare and hard to find. And I don't want to go scouring all the way across the city to find. I just would buy online on an app. So I think it's coming down to what you're buying online. Um, and I think the model that we've seen that's been very successful in the startup community anyways is a company called Frank and & Oak. And they're sort of paving the way for this new model, which is retail and online. So you go into a Frank & Oak store, you try things on, you, you mark down what your sizes are there on their, on their app, and then it's shipping you stuff you know, according to what actually fits you in their different styles. And so I think we're starting to see this merger between the two things. But when it comes to traditional retail, I mean, imagine the margins and the, the cutthroat things that must be happening on the sourcing side at Macy's. It, it must, be just, uh, must be just insane. Now, we mentioned this uh, before the break, this uh, having a little less alcohol in your beer and wine. This is a recommendation actually coming from... CAMH, which is the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, and they put this article in a medical journal, and the lead researcher is saying, guess what? You can reduce the alcohol in these drinks, and most people won't notice. They've done these studies, and they're saying if you did reduce the amount of, of alcohol, for example, in beer from an average of 5.5% down to 4.5%, the actual benefit on health would be tremendous. So they're putting it out there. I mean, it's not as if any of the beer or wine companies are necessarily going to do exactly what CAMH says, but what do you think of the idea? Is, would that be a smart policy move to cut down on alcohol for the sake of people's health? Yeah, the syntax, right? I mean, instinctively, I, I wasn't sure I liked it. I wasn't sure it would change behavior, but when I looked into the data, it's shown that it has traditionally changed people's behavior, that if the taxes increase on things like cigarettes, and now we're talking about alcohol percentages in, in glasses of beer, they actually do change their behavior. So for that reason, it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the, the mental health things associated with that are, I think it's really, it's a positive thing for Canada. It's interesting, though. They, I don't think CAMH even really has to push this so hard because there apparently is quite a growing trend in terms of lower alcohol drinks. It's like, it's not, again, sort of the whole health awareness and growing wellness trend and so forth. Even in Britain, I saw research that sales have grown 5% year over year of non-alcoholic beer. Wow. Go down to the pub for a pint of nothing, basically. But I think it could be in the best interest of the beer industry to get behind this because they can focus more. You see a lot of microbreweries focusing on unique tastes and, you know, their unique brands. And I think, you know, they don't want to be painted with a negative brush and become the tobacco of the future. So I, I see it as a positive thing. All right. Thanks so much, Nicole. Thanks, Dan.